Hello, everybody, and welcome to another author interview. Today, I am joined by the wave maker of recent days, and that will be Brandon Sanderson, the now highest funded person ever on Kickstarter with the recent announcement of his secret projects. How's it going, Sanderson? And more importantly, how are the last couple of weeks been going? I mean, I can't complain, right? We went into this thinking maybe two to four million, hoping for five, and we're sitting at like 27. So, I mean, that's pretty great. It seemed like it would be foolish for me to ask if this went past expectations, but I actually am more interested in what your... Uh, feelings have been around the larger reaction. I mean, this has gone far beyond just Kickstarter and fantasy for circles where mainstream magazines are covering this. I'm seeing faces from you from like 2002 plastered all over the place. How has that felt? Did you see that coming at all? You know, um, yes and no at the same time. So I've always had uh, big goals, big aspirations. I felt this sort of attention would come. Uh, I thought it would take until I had films and television shows, right? Like one of my one of my kind of sneaky goals is to uh, slowly become Stan Lee esque, uh, where I get a a lot of things adapted and you get to see me in each of them. Uh, my whole goal is actually that uh, I will die in each of the shows in different ways. Uh, as recompense for killing off characters. Um, and I look <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to the day where I can go to Comic-Con and sit with all the, you know, movie stars in the line where they're signing autographs. And the autographs, that pictures that people are getting of me are my various death poses. But, uh, you know, I assumed eventually, like, you know, fantasy in general, nerd culture in general, has become mainstream pop culture, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I assumed at some point... Uh, the mainstream media attention would be like, wait, who's this Sanderson guy that everyone's talking about? Um, I didn't think the Kickstarter would be what got me there. Uh, mm -hmm. So I knew the potential was there because we in nerd cultures, like in nerd culture, we have lots of uh, powerful fandoms, shall we say. Yes. And um, there are things that we're really interested in. And these do tend to filter to the general public's attention eventually um so i don't want to sound like oh yes i knew i was going to be all that uh, i knew the potential was there um mm -hmm. i just didn't expect this to kick it off right and even this it's i'm getting mainstream media attention but not still even like um i've I've only had like two television requests, which is still great. No, don't get me wrong. The general media um, doesn't tend to pay that much attention to fantasy. Uh, news or print media does. Uh, you know, New York Times and Washington Post and The Guardian, they were all over it immediately. They, they watch books. They're interested in books. Their readership likes books. But it's like the, the television shows, they're like, Whoo, uh, who is this nerd? Let, let's talk to this nerd. No, I, I have to ask a follow-up to an offhanded comment there. You said you'd like to die in every adaptation. Is there a particular death from a story you'd love to have, like, Syl thrown you, through you at a distance? Or is there a <laughs> death that stands out from the Cosmere that really should be Sanderson? Um, uh, you know, I the only really dramatic one that I think of is uh, Vin and uh, Zane's assault on the Keep in Book 2 of uh, Mistborn. Um, there's like... There's like a a semi lobby sequence from Matrix esque se sequence in Mistborn too. Um, that's that's one of the ones where I'm like I, I ought to be on that wall um, when they come passing by. But no, I haven't really otherwise thought. Mm, who should I be? Uh, I want to not be distracting. So like I can't. I don't want to be like the one of the guys who dies in the bridge cruise that's all very dramatic and things. I want, you know, real actors for those. Peter Jackson died in a really fun way in the um, third Lord of the Rings films, right? He's all done up in makeup, so you can barely tell it's him, but he does a very good death, and that's inspiration to me. Uh, you know, that's that's my kind, the behind-the-scenes guy who uh, gets to get shot by a bunch of arrows, Um I want to be there. That's what I aspire to, Daniel. Uh, so getting back into this Kickstarter momentum, uh, there has been already reactions from across the board. I have to ask, did you see Will White's parody uh, video? I, I thought it was hilarious. He even dressed up like me a little bit. You know, it was good. In terms of the author community response, has there been people reaching out to you for advice and tips on how to roll out the similar kind of platform you've been building over the last few years? 
Um, so yes and no. Um, again, one of these dual answers. So <laughs> I have gotten some sort of this um, from most people who are in the know, people who are working professionals, they realize that this is not something that's easy to give any tips for, um, right? Like, yeah. how, how, do you, how do you have a giant Kickstarter like this? Well, the answer is you start with an enormous fan base. Yeah. Uh, oh, is that all? Oh, it's <laughs> super easy, right? And you build that over 20 years' time um, and become a leader in your genre and then you can do a giant Kickstarter. Um, so I haven't really gotten, I've gotten a lot of congratulations from my writer friends and things like that. Uh, and a lot of kind of, what do you think this means for the industry sort of questions, mm -hmm. but not a lot yet of, hey, how do I do this myself? Um, maybe that, that will happen. Unfortunately, there's not a huge amount of advice I can give, right? Like uh, build a good audience. And then the thing about this is, is um, I have I have a staff. I have a warehouse. Uh, I I joke that you know most authors don't have that infrastructure and don't really want it, right? I have an HR director. People don't become fantasy novelists because they want to work a job where they have an HR director in general, <laughs> right? Uh, I love my HR director, by the way. He's great. But these sorts of things, like I have an entrepreneurial mindset. I wanted to found a company and I wanted to build up the infrastructure of that company. And part of the reason, there are a lot of reasons I did the Kickstarter, but part of the reason was I, I wanted to say to them, hey, let's see if we can do direct fulfillment on a actual Sanderson novel mm -hmm. um, and see what that looks like. So this kind of leads to an angle of the publishing that I don't think most people get to see. And even some authors don't get that deep of an insight in. And that's with what you can do with your success after you've reached a point where you don't need to entirely rely on trad publishing. For your fans, what would you consider yourself now? I would consider myself basically where I've always been, which is a hybrid. Okay. I think that mo for most authors, some version of hybrid it should be in the forefront of their mind. And it's not exactly the you know option for everyone, but... I think it's the most flexible option. And when I say hybrid, it means picking some projects to do independently and some projects to do traditionally. And there are still things that traditional publishing offers. Like my Kickstarter, my biggest regret, and the reason why I wouldn't, for instance, take a Stormlight book and do it this way mm -hmm. is Kickstarter cuts out the bookstores. Mm -hmm. uh, and I feel that bookstores are our best current hedge against Amazon's dominance in the market and I worry about Amazon. Mm -hmm. uh, I would love if there were one or two big, good competitors for Amazon. Um, and right now, those are the bookstores, and my, my career was partially made by bookstore employees sharing my books with people, and I think that bookstores are really important. Uh, the more we lose the bookstores, the harder it is for new authors to break into the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's dangerous for the whole industry. Uh, the more bestseller focused we become, the more as an industry we are, you know, preparing for our own demise, so to speak, because, um, you know, the industry can't run on Brandon Sanderson forever. Um, <laughs> and so I don't want to cut out the bookstores, um, but I do want to send a bit of a wake up call to publishers, right? Like, this is not me breaking up with them. I told them ahead of time I was doing this. I told them they couldn't have these books. Uh, but I made very clear to Tor and to Delacorte, my, my two main publishers, Galance as well, that, um, that I really like them, that they've, I know they've done some difficult things that I've requested of them, and I still intend to keep publishing books with them. I think that they serve some really vital purposes. Like, if you look at how many people back this Kickstarter, still... Fantastic, right? We're we're 110,000 uh, people or something like that, but that's still a fraction of my audience. Most of my audience still wants to just go to the bookstore and pick up a book, or pick up their device and buy at their ebook or audiobook uh, retailer of choice. And I totally respect that. That's great. Uh, but traditional publishing serves that pretty well. So uh, it's not a breakup, but it is a wake up call. 
there are some things about traditional publishing that I think are backward thinking, and I wanted to kind of prove to them a bunch of things I've been saying for many years. Mm -hmm. it's, it rings extremely true with what you're saying with conversations I've had with authors, large to small, about how even some of the ways that have proven themselves to be successful for marketing at a small level or falling apart, they're seeing smaller returns on Facebook ads, Amazon promotion. And so it's, it's heartwarming for me to see anyone try and shake up this industry because I don't know of a way right now, aside from just browsing a shelf, to find an author who's just breaking out. Um, so it's it's really nice to hear you speak on that, but shifting gears a little bit, you spoke about phone calls, about shows. I know we can't get into conversations around that, but uh, I am curious to note if over the years you've noticed a response when it comes to science fiction versus fantasy, because you're firmly planted in both fields. And do the calls regarding adaptation between the two genres differ much? Is there a higher interest for something like Skyward right away? Or is Mistborn just always gonna be the number one cell or number one point of interest? So it is, a, it's a, that's an excellent question. Uh, so I've noticed a shift as the books have sold more and more. Uh, early in my career, epic fantasy was really hard to convince people to take a chance on, right? Uh, whereas when I would release something like Legion, um, which is, could have a smaller budget, it like sold immediately, right? It's just like, bam. Uh, even something like Alcatraz versus Evil Librarians, because it's set mostly in our world with some fantastical elements, very much easier to sell. Uh, basically, they would look at it and say, what would the budget require to do this well? And in the epic fantasies, they would say, uh, not interested. Mm. Um, now, two things have changed that. Number one, nowadays when people say, hey, who's this Brandon Sanderson person in Hollywood? They immediately go to BookScan, which is the Nielsen ratings for books. They pull them up, and then they say, oh, this is who he is. Well, buy that, and they will point to the top of the list, which is Mistborn. Right. Um, because Mistborn is slightly outsold Stormlight because it has twice as many books in the series. Um, Stormlight sells more on a book per book basis. Um, but they're kind of neck and neck for total sales. So they'll be like, buy that. And beyond that, the last couple of years, we've seen that the streaming services in particular are willing to foot very large bills for epic fantasy properties, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're throwing around the, the 10 to $15 million budgets that they used to give only to top dramas with very big actors. And now they're like, oh, wait, fantasy, we can do this too. Uh, and so those are getting snatched up and made. And so the attention has shifted for those two reasons uh, for me. But I think in general, people are going to be science fiction. It's easier to sell to a general audience. And if it's grounded in our world, if it's one of these science fictions that, you know, you don't have to do as many practical or special effects for, then, yeah, they, they like to buy those. And with your perspective as the person who is the mastermind behind these worlds, when you see new technology like what's being used on The Mandalorian, like these right. immersive domes that cut out green screens largely, does that kind of give you hope for some really amazing things or are you hardcore in the camp of practical effects and minimal CG, we're gonna stay away from those screens. <laughs> I mean, I feel like the best things that are getting made right now are doing both. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're a new tool, right? And the new tool can do some really cool and interesting things. Um, and the fact that my friends made that tool uh, is, you know, the, the, the folks over at Epic. Um, that's uh, definitely something I've paid attention to. I've been watching behind the scenes as they have built this new technology and gone over to Lucasfilm and used it for various things. But there are certain things that I would just want to be practical. Mm -hmm. I thought that when in Wheel of Time they did pr Trollocs with practical effects, it looked a lot better than when they used the CG Trollocs when they were kind of forced to at the end of the series because of COVID restraints, right? Mm -hmm. Best of both worlds, right? Use the right tool for the right moment. That's the, I think, the best answer you can give. Now, you brought up the Wheel of Time, though, and one of the biggest discussions going on in any fantasy circle is the upcoming Lord of the Rings show. Has that caught your eye? Are you excited for that? Do you have any opinions on, you know, what covering the Second Age and how that should be done? <laughs> so I am not the most enormous Tolkien nerd out there, right? Um, I have Stop the presses. <laughs> yeah, Ooh, I know. Um, I tried to read Lord of the Rings when I was a young man and bounced off it, right, when I was a kind of a weaker reader, and then didn't read it until my young 20s, 
when I could really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Um, And then really did appreciate it and have since read it a couple of more times. But I have never gotten all the way through the Silmarillion, right? And while I've probably read The Hobbit, you know, a half dozen times, Lord of the Rings, I've only read like two or three times, well, probably three times. Um, And so uh, while I think Peter Jackson's films are absolute masterworks, and I think the books are absolute masterworks, I'm not sitting here biting my nails, uh, worried about the adaptation. Um, I hope it's good. I hope it's fantastic. Uh, I think excellent fantasy adaptations are good for all of us in the industry. Yes. (laughs) Um, And so uh, I hope that it's good. I hope that it being really good helps uh, the Wheel of Time also uh, as the the sister uh, project at the same company. And so I am cautiously optimistic. I think that's the mode that most of us are in right now, but that is the mode I'm in. All right, I'll shift gears here back to the Cosmere, and I'm, I've, I've noticed something I think a lot of fans have picked up on, and there's a feeling of passing time within the Cosmere. I mean, we're seeing Mistborn jump forward ages, Stormlight Archive is now introducing new tech, and you're also just kind of dabbling into science fiction outside of the Cosmere with things like Skyward. Is there going to become a time where sci fantasy is a better description of what's going on within the Cosmere as your writing progresses? Or is this to you always firmly going to be a fantasy series? No, I think you're probably right. Like I've told fans for years, what I'm pushing toward is something a little more Star Wars esque in the larger world building where you're going to many different planets mm-hmm. uh, and there's both a science fiction and fantasy mix. Um, you know, one of my favorite uh, movies, despite how it's aging worse and worse, uh, is The Fifth Element, mm-hmm. um, right? Um, and I like this, I like that blend a lot um, of science fiction and fantasy. I suspect that there will always be places where I'm doing straight up true fantasy in the Cosmere, mm-hmm. um, that the it will give me enough opportunities to go to planets where some of this tech just hasn't reached yet and do fantasy stories. But the main uh, through line of the Cosmere is pushing towards sci fantasy. And that kind of leads to a question where does the complete opposite end of the spectrum attract you within the Cosmere? Writing something that is hard science fiction, maybe something in the more of a vein of a Star Trek than fantasy at all, or is it more just going to be sci fantasy? I mean, I could see myself doing something Star Trek, which is Star Trek is like I I would call Star Trek hard fantasy, but it's like the lightest of hard fantasy. Um, (laughs) I I could see myself doing that. Um, I could see myself doing military science fiction, but true Arthur C. Clarke style hard science fiction uh, is not something I'm equipped really well to write. Um, I could do it. It would take a lot of work and uh, a lot of help from professionals. So it's not impossible, but you know, writing a the the Cosmere version of Red Mars um, is just not something that's really in my wheelhouse. Uh, I'll leave that to the Kim, Kim Stanley Robinsons of the world mm-hmm. um, and those who are really good at the actual technology. There's a reason why, or the actual science, why I make up half of my science, and it's because that's what interests me and I find fun. Uh, While I won't ever say no to anything that I might write in the future, I think that one's fairly unlikely. Well, the the closest I've seen from you, I believe, was the original, which I quite enjoyed. And so a Sanderson approach to hard sci-fi, I would not be against. Uh, I had a co-author on that one, so (laughs) who is a bit more scientifically minded. Well, that, that... Putting these questions together, uh, you know, almost every other fantasy franchise I can think of that's on the scope of a Cosmere like Forgotten Realms, Warhammer, has multiple authors contributing. The Cosmere, though, is your child. Is there ever going to be a foreseeable future where you will let someone else's pen enter that space or this is the Sanderson sphere? (laughs) Uh, No, I have said that I will let Isaac write in this. And if you don't know who Isaac is, Isaac is my... Uh, longtime kind of art director, friend, and now creative director at my company. 
Um, and he's always had a writing bug. He's written six or seven novels. And he's asked if he could write a Mistborn novel. And I said yes. And, uh, you know, if that comes out and it's publishable quality, um, I've said he can publish it either with my name and I work on it with him. Or if he wanted to just publish Mistborn novels just as Isaac Stewart, I told him he would be allowed to do that too because, you know, he's been a longtime collaborator and uh, helped me a lot with the visual development um, and things like that. Um, and so I can see a world where I let select individuals come in and kind of do their own thing. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't matter as much that it has my voice if it's their story in the Cosmere, uh, if that makes any sense. Where something more like Steelheart, I'm like, it's continuing my series. Therefore, it should try to do some of the same things that I have been doing um, in the main series. Okay, that makes complete sense. And I would love to also ask you about, I believe today as of recording this, the announcement for the second secret project has been released. Yes. And it has one of my favorite titles I have seen this year. Uh, would you mind speaking about this project that is just fresh new off the presses? <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you want spoilerific or non-spoilerific on oh, this? I will, dealer's choice, go ham. Okay, I will talk spoilerific. So if you are being preserved... Some of my fans are wa not wanting to get even the title spoiled. Mm -hmm. So uh, stop the video now if you're preserving yourself on spoilers. So years ago, um, a title popped into my head, and it was called The Frugal Wizard's Guide to London. Uh, and I'm like, wow, that's a good title. Uh, it feels too Harry Potter-esque. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, I don't know what I'll do with that, but once in a while you get one of those titles, and as a writer, you're like, I need to find the book for that title. The Way of Kings was another one. Mm -hmm. um, well, the frugal wizard idea was really fun to me. Um, and then over COVID, one of the things I often do when I'm going to bed is I just tell myself a story uh, as I'm going to sleep. Um, <clears throat> I This is something I've done since I was a kid. I have insomnia, and this is just a way to pass the time. I actually have a pretty good insomnia medicine right now, and so it's no longer hours. It's more like, you know, 15 or 20 minutes, but <laughs> I tell myself a story. And one of the things I was telling stories in my head about was people doing time travel uh, disaster tourism. I did a whole podcast with Dan on this. Um, this is just the idea of what if, what if you were to write books where <clears throat> or have a story where someone could travel into the past to a kind of famous event and not have to worry about changing the future. If you could just take that element away and just have fun with doing tourism in the past. Um, and this mashed with that sort of title. I'm like, what if the frugal wizard, what if that were a reference to the idea that, uh, that people can travel the dimensions and go to different time periods? And the frugal wizard's a person who wrote guidebooks for if you want to, for instance, <laughs> go back to the Titanic. And it's like the frugal wizard's handbook for how to, you know, survive the Titanic if you want to go have that experience, right? Uh, and so Secret Project 2 is actually somebody who goes back to medieval England uh, for reasons that are mysterious in the book, uh, I haven't revealed them yet, but it's the, the Frugal Wizard's Handbook for Surviving Medieval England. Um, and part of the joke is that the Frugal Wizard's Handbook is, uh, it's an interesting, got an interesting voice. It's uh, Hitchhiker's Guide-esque where the main character is getting these entries explaining the, yeah, uh, <laughs> the world to him. And they are written in a voice that is... Uh, that is uh, very distinctive, shall we say. I love um, it. And so, yeah. It sounds like it has incredible potential for a series. Has that been in your head at all, or is this a clear oh, yeah. one shot? Okay. Yeah, that, I, I, I wrote this. I am not going to turn this into a series myself, but I brainstormed a lot of the ideas for this with Dan Wells. Uh, and so I can absolutely see Dan writing, uh, and the fictional author of the handbook itself, the in-world book, is uh, a character that Dan and I have both used in our books. You know, this guy, Cecil G. Bagsworth III, interdimensional uh, explorer. Uh, so he's the author of the Frugal Wizard's Handbook, and so he's a, he's actually a shared character of Dan and mine. So I would, if, if people like this book, I would expect that Dan will want to take a crack at doing some other Frugal Wizard adjacent story. Um, so I was about yeah. to guess it was wit somehow, but okay, that's not. No, <laughs> no. Uh, Cecil is far less useful than wit is. Let's just say. And is this targeted towards a more YA audience, general, or is it not really having general audience? audience. Yeah. 
Okay. Now, if this is general audience, um, it's uh, it's it's meant. Uh, I kind of pitched it to my fans. It's kind of I'm doing the when he first arrives in the past, he doesn't remember how he got there. I'm kind of playing with the Jason Bourne style plot, but it's like Jason Bourne mixed with. Um, uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy mixed with Timeline by Michael Crichton and just a little bit of Harry Dresden. Well, if that pitch doesn't sell you on at least checking out Secret Project 2 or the Kickstarter, I don't know what will. If you mention Hitchhiker's Guide, I'm in. I just want to say thank you so much for Sanderson for willing to swing on by and talk to me about your recent monumental success. <laughs> thank you very much, Daniel. It's a blast as always. All right, well, have a great one, and like and subscribe if you have not already. Hit the Patreon if you want to support what I do here. A link to the Kickstarter and the Secret Project 2 announcement video will be linked down below. And have a good one, y'all. Bye!